a lot of people ask, who were the first people with hemochromatosis and how did they get it? And this is one of the first areas of uncertainty. And um, for a long time, people said that they thought it started in 800 BC. And there was a, a feeling that it probably started in Brittany. That feeling came from the fact that there was such a dense cluster of people in Brittany with hemochromatosis. You, you might have chosen to start in Dublin, Ireland. That's another cluster. So how did they get 800 BC? Well, the simple answer is they, they estimate how many people in the world they think have hemochromatosis now. So in countries that have a census, you can calculate the number of Caucasian people. This is self-reported Caucasian and multiply that by the prevalence figures like we determined in the AIR study, which showed that one in 227 Caucasian people had full-blown hemochromatosis, and about one in 10 carried the gene. In places where there's a cluster, like Dublin, it's one in four carry the gene, which is really amazing to think that a genetic disease could be that common and still thriving in Dublin. And that raises a, an interesting question about hemochromatosis, about whether there's a biological advantage in having the genes. So don't get too sad, you might be the lucky folks. <laughs> a little more information came on this when the gene was discovered in 1996. Because people were able to use the genetic blood tests on historical samples, not quite that old, and we're able to use the test as a, almost an anthropology tool to look at migration of people. And one of the first groups to report on the gene was from Iceland. And they found that there were lots of people in Iceland that had hemochromatosis genes. The Vikings, of course, were in Iceland all the time. But the French and the Irish explorers were not going to Iceland. There were some Irish women that were taken to Iceland as kind of slaves. But this leads more credence to the idea that maybe the Vikings were the first people with hemochromatosis. Now sometime later in 2004, this person who's from Scandinavia published this theory that it actually started in 4000 BC. So that's much, much earlier. And she makes an argument that it comes from Central Europe the Gauls. This is more like the area around central Germany. Now one of the more interesting projects that I did with a medical student, this was Caitlin Simonette, who's still in training at Western, and we got her interested in doing a project on mitochondrial DNA. It's a particular type of DNA analysis that can take your family back 50,000 years in time because they say that it doesn't change over time, whereas a regular DNA sample, not a mitochondrial sample, tends to mutate and recombine and rearrange, and so there are changes over time. So the people that discovered this mitochondrial DNA thing were in Oxford, England, and they were the ones that hypothesized that all human life started in Africa from seven distinct tribes and then people migrated to various parts in the world. So I wondered whether everybody who has hemochromatosis now could have come from the same ancestral tribe. And the conclusion was that not everybody with hemochromatosis is from the same tribe. So this suggests that if the original mutation happened, it happened after they moved out of Africa. I'm just mentioning it because it's an interesting story. And people often ask about genealogy and how did they get it and so on. So, so really the story of hemochromatosis now is the story of Celtic migration. This is a picture of the Celtic Empire, the ancient Celtic Empire. Many people, when they hear Celtic, they think of men in skirts throwing logs somewhere in Ireland or Scotland. And that that is a subgroup. That's the stereotype Celtic person. But the Celtic Empire was a much bigger area that encompassed most of Central Europe seen here. And as Ian mentioned, uh, Brittany in France 
there was a cross-migration during the Norman Conquest over to the UK, and there's a lot of similarities in Brittany. You know, they, they, they play bagpipes, they speak Gaelic, they drink a lot. Uh, they, they, they have lots of, they have dances and stuff that are similar to Irish country dances. Uh, so there, there, there are definitely some similarities there. In London, Ontario, many of the families that we see come from this area here, uh, which is northern Portugal. And uh, many people would think, well, gee, I didn't know Portuguese people get hemochromatosis. We think of this as kind of a, a white Celtic disease. And the Portuguese people have the Moorish genes mixed in with them. That's why they have darker skin. But in the north in Portugal, there's a link to Celtic genes. So they're definitely involved. And of course, we see lots of people whose roots are on the continent, Germany, Holland, Belgium, Denmark. Sweden, Norway, all those kinds of places. But here you see on this map that the empire also extended over to Turkey, uh, parts of northern Italy, and well over into these areas here too. And I, I can't say that I've seen people from these areas over here that have classical hemochromatosis. We have seen some up from this region. Remember too that there's been a migration of military action here for hundreds and hundreds of years. We you know with the Crusaders and Napoleon and the World Wars and so on. And some of these genes get left behind in some of these regions. And we talked about the migration from Brittany. This is Jacques Cartier, also Champlain, who went to Lower Canada, up the St. Lawrence River. And many people feel that maybe the genes we have in Canada now came from those ships. And I've been trying to entice some people, some young people, and it's even possible we could do it through the Canadian Hemochromatosis Society, to try to link your family surnames to the names of the people that were on the ships. Because they are, they are readily available. Quebec has put a big emphasis on their past history. And the names of the people on those ships are on the internet. But there are ways in genealogy to approach that. And it would be interesting to see how much linkage we could make with hemochromatosis families in Canada and these explorers. We have this migration to Australia. These were the prisoners that were sent to Australia. People are clamoring to prove that they're from these people, because these are now the good guys. These are like the Mayflower people. So uh, people will brag about the fact that their ancestors were sent to this horrible penal colony in Tasmania and so on. Now, there was a migration to South Africa, both from England and from Holland. And there are groups of people in South Africa, white people, who have classical hemochromatosis. There's also another type of iron overload that occurs in black people, in Bantu people, that is not the same type we're talking about here. This is a migration that is probably the least understood. This is from Wales to this part of Argentina. This happened in the 19th century. This was a religious persecution. And this part of Argentina, now all the towns there have Welsh names, and the people who live in these towns speak a Welsh dialect. And there's a very big cluster of hemochromatosis living in that area as well. 